Sports Podcast with Joe and Dave. Be warned, the discussions in this podcast will contain detailed spoilers. For spoiler-free reviews of newly released films, please check out our channel, Reviews Without Remorse, on YouTube and Vidme. Enter at your own risk and enjoy the show. Mr. Anderson. Surprised to see me? As you well know, appearances can be deceiving. We are not here because we are free. We are here because we are not free. There is no escaping reviews without remorse. There is no denying reviews without remorse. Because as we both know, without reviews without remorse, we would not exist. It is Reviews Without Remorse that created us. Reviews Without Remorse that connects us. Reviews Without Remorse that pulls us. That guides us. That drives us. It is Reviews Without Remorse that defines us. Reviews Without Remorse that binds us. We are here because of Reviews Without Remorse. And this is episode number 95. And in this episode, Avengers Endgame. We got a new title and a new trailer. We will analyze and discuss... Also, Godzilla, King of Monsters, drops a new trailer. We will share our thoughts. And then, finally, if you can't beat us, join us as we discuss The Matrix Reloaded. What's up, partner? I would like to apologize to the audience in advance for my terrible Harvey Firestein impression. I have a bit of a cold, but the show must go on, ladies and gentlemen. But other than that, I am good. Hey, Miss Potts. If you find this recording, don't feel better about this. Part of the journey is the end. Just for the record, being adrift in space with zero promise of rescue is more fun than it sounds. Food and water ran out four days ago. Oxygen will run out tomorrow morning. That'll be it. When I drift off, I will dream about you. It's always you. Avengers Endgame, my friend. What did you think? Okay, so first of all, Thor is a douchebag. <laughs> Why is Thor a douchebag? Uh, if, if, because there is Tony Stark. Uh, by the way, loved the trailer. Felt it was perfectly minimal and yet shows the position of the two biggest characters in the Marvel Cinematic Universe right now and what they're facing. And there is Tony Stark on the Milano alone, why he's alone, who knows, nobody knows where Nebula is, he's running out of food and water. And what did Thor do in Avengers Infinity War before he left the Milano? He took all their food and water! (laughs) Uh, (laughs) That's funny. Well... (laughs) Uh, by, I'm sorry, by the way, it's not the Milano. Actually, this new ship is called the Benatar. My apologies. I, I was going to say, actually, technically, it's not the Milano. It is a different different ship. And it, and by the way, Nebula is there. I don't know. How, I, I Again, I, I can't tell how it plays out, but there is a shot of her in the ship. Yes. So, yeah, it kind of remains to be seen. What's, what's up with that? Maybe she doesn't need food or water because she's so half robotic or something or other. Um, no, they, they actually, in, in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, she made a big deal about wanting that fruit that everybody kept saying wasn't ripe, so she eats. She just probably doesn't need as much. Okay, okay. I thought the whole thing, I mean, I, you know, it was great because, thankfully, it didn't give us much. It oh, frankly it didn't really... anything. What's that? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it really didn't tell us anything that we don't already know, really. The fact that Hawkeye is going to be in it, not a surprise. The fact that Ant-Man is going to be in it, not a surprise. Just seeing where Tony is, seeing where Cap is, I thought it was a perfect setup to not, you know, again, didn't didn't spoil anything as far as I can tell, for sure. No. Uh, so, yeah, and it just, they're they're hatching a plan to try to do something, and that's really, again, we nothing we didn't know already, just got the, got the blood going, you know? Oh, did it ever get the blood going, man? Just... Tony recording that last message to Pepper. And funnily enough, isn't it? it, You got to love the symmetry that they've built into this. You know, there he is basically all alone on a spaceship. And he's basically dressed the same way he was when he was in the cave when he first made the first Iron Man suit. Ah, okay. Okay. You know? There you go. You've got that. And then you've got Cap who, when has Cap ever said the words, I don't know what else I'm going to do if this doesn't work? When has he ever not been the voice of confidence and perseverance? Yeah, yeah. 
that was just heartbreaking. Yeah, you don't me. you don't hear a lot of desperation from him, but that sounded pretty desperate. Yeah. Really, really, uh, it's such a small, small little teaser. Nothing major, no major special effects. A brief, brief shot of Thanos walking through a field. Uh, that wonderful shot of uh, Hawkeye, but now probably as his other character, Ronan. He was uh-huh. a Ronan for a little while there. Mm-hmm. And just by the expression on his face, you you could see his freaking family got snapped. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's he, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. He was looking pretty desperate at the end of his rope too. So that's it's gonna be interesting to give him a lot. I, I get the, I get the sense they're gonna give him a lot more to do this time. And, I hope so. You know, probably pretty clever to not have certain characters in the first Infinity War because you folk you already had a lot of characters to, to characters to juggle. Now you're gonna let the few that weren't there before shine a little bit here. Again, seems like a pretty smart move in my opinion. I hope so. It, it, everything is looking good. And honestly, I, I, I said it to my son. It's like, you know what? I don't need to see another trailer. I'm already hyped to see this movie, and I feel like anything further now is going to spoil the movie. Kind of, yeah. I, like, I mean, I, there's probably more. They, they, they can probably do a little more without spoiling anything substantial, but I completely agree with you. If I don't see another one until I walk in the, the theater, I'm fine with that. So you'd want to make Godzilla our pet? No. We would be his. Okay. I gotta admit, I geeked at the ever-living hell out of that Godzilla (laughs) trailer. I don't even care what the damn plot is. (laughs) Just seeing all those monsters just flying around. That last shot of Godzilla rushing King Ghidorah is like (laughs) the coolest thing I have seen. In a long time, with regards to a Godzilla movie. Absolutely. I did the same thing. I kind of was like, you know what? I, I don't even care what the plot is. I don't even care who's in it, who's doing what. I, but, you know, you're just seeing all those, all of the classic Godzilla monsters on the big screen looking, you know, kind of getting the cinematic treatment that they so deserve. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm going to be there, and I... You know, I, I'm actually, I, and I, I would never have guessed. I mean, I think honestly, all the other Godzillas up until now, like the, you know, the first Godzilla they redid, and then the the Kong Island was was good. I mean, it's, but you know, but I, I, I when they were, were announced, I wasn't really excited for because I just felt like, yeah, you know, it's gonna be another big giant CGI crap fest. What's the difference? This one, I'm actually genuinely a little excited for. Kind of, it's, it really is kind of grabbing my attention, and I want to see this played out. It's looking pretty good. Well, I feel like that, it, it, it weirdly, they, they're getting a semi idea of the Marvel formula. They do the first Godzilla movie, they give Godzilla his due. Then they did the Kong movie, and they gave Kong his due. Now it's Godzilla against all the rest of the uh, monsters of the world. And then, the fo- you know, the follow up to this, and they're filming it right now, is Godzilla versus King Kong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I knew that was on the slate, so it's yeah. I, I'm pretty. But this is world building. This is good world building. From what we can tell, yeah, I agree. Yeah. They, right? They didn't. They didn't um, telegraph a whole lot in the Kong movie. They didn't. Yeah, I, I, I'm on board. I, I think they're doing a fine job, and they're doing it without. Again, it's not like they came out one day and said, "Okay, this is Universal Monster Universe. Get ready for <laughs> twenty movies to watch." You know, they, they're just doing them in little by little, and yeah, I mean, they're not. I. It's it's they're doing it right. Yes, they are. I, I completely agree. I, I really got a kick out of it, had a smile on it. Liam was kind of feeling a little bit eh the past couple of days, and he just had the biggest grin on his face and he couldn't wait to see it. Here we go. Hi, you fellas. It's him. Do we proceed? Yes. You still only human. All of our lives, we have fought this war. Tonight, I believe we can end it. That's a nice trick. Huh. Upgrades. Mr. Anderson. Surprised to see me? So now he's found a way to copy himself. Now there's more than one of them. A lot more. Following the events of The Matrix, 
Neo and the rebel leaders estimate they have 72 hours until 250,000 probes discover Zion and destroy it and its inhabitants. Neo must decide how he can save Trinity from a dark fate in his dreams. Written and directed by the Wachowski brothers, again, the easiest introduction I've ever had to do, <laughs> Matrix, The Matrix, Reloaded. Now, you know what's funny? I still like the movie, and I feel like a lot of this movie suffers from its sequel, because there is a bunch of ideas and setup that happens in this movie that don't pay off. And I think that the fact that they didn't pay off in Revolutions, which we'll get to next week, is part of the reason why we look back at Reloaded in such a quizzical, what-the-hell way. Because mm. I actually found myself really enjoying the movie. I wasn't a big fan of the 4 minute and 31 seconds, and yes, I timed it, rave scene. Because <laughs> I kind of felt like that was a little too much. Yeah. But other than that, I, I kind of enjoyed the movie. Mm. I, you know, it's funny you say that because I had the same experience. I, I really sort of went into this one with a sense of dread, going like, "Oh yeah, this is that one." And uh, I, 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 you know, I mean, again, I'd seen it, I knew what to expect, but I, I really did enjoy it a lot more than I was expecting. I mean, it's certainly, certainly not a perfect film by any stretch. Um, no, 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 no. But there's, but they, they definitely give you a lot, and I, I kind of felt like, you know, my general feeling was that okay. This is a a beautiful stew that was just not cooked properly. You know, it's like they, they took a, a terrific sirloin steak and they threw it into a pot. They threw a bunch of potatoes and carrots into the pot. They forgot to chop it up. Uh, they dumped a ton of seasoning in it. But, you know, again, they forgot to sort of prepare it. And that's sort of what you get. You get big chunks of action. You get big chunks of philosophy, exposition, that's not blended together the way it was in the first one. The, the first mm-hmm. one had like that, that super duper tight script where everything was happening for a reason, all of the exposition. And, and again, in the first one, that's where you needed to dump a lot of exposition because everything is set up. Yeah. Here, I mean, there's, they're, they're definitely trying to expand greatly on what they set up on the first one. Um, you know, and, and I guess I got to give them props in that respect because they easily could have just said, okay, we set up the universe, we set up the rules. Now we can just kind of go and play in this, in the world again here. They really try to just sort of do it again and say, well, look, well now we got to We got to take it up a notch. Okay. All right. But again, it's, it's just not, it's not done with that same finesse that the first one had, like I said, big chunky blocks of exposition and big blocks of action um a lot of it is very satisfying it's i but again i I think it's just that that the 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 way they did it the 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 spot-on professional way that they crafted that script in the first one they didn't put that same thought into the script here so the story is really clunky there's a lot of things that could have been done differently and it just ends up with a, a, a different feel, too. It's kind of bizarre. Like, for just, just as an example, they, they show up at Zion in the beginning, which I kind of find to be sort of weird. I kind of feel like it, if it was up to me, armchair quarterbacking. <laughs> Are you already doing your who asked you, Joe? Well, I'll probably be doing that for, for the next 45 minutes. But, uh, I mean, seriously, you, Neo shows up at Zion. Now, if you wanted to keep that same fish out of water feel from the first one, right? Keep that that protagonist that we can relate to because everything is new and exciting. Well, you could have had him show up at Zion for the first time and say, wow, this is look what a marvel this is. And let's look around and take it all in and yada, yada, yada. Instead, he kind of just sort of breezes in like he's been there 10 times already. And then then everybody gets dressed for the rave, right? They kind of put their nice clothes on. Right. And I'm like, and and plus they're all sort of wearing these kind of fancy outfits for the big meetings and the military people. It almost kind of had that Star Trek feel like like the the kind of casual clothes they would wear in like Star Trek three and four. You know what I mean? I I couldn't shake that. It had this this really really bad Star Trek vibe and it was annoying me. But then I'm like, okay. But then when they leave again, it's like, okay, everybody put your dingy sweaters on with the holes in it to get back on the ship to take off. Well, 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 you had nice clothes. You just showed us that you can you can have nice clothes. Why do you put the the, the holy sweaters back on? 
So anyway, the, I mean, just to, as a starting off point, I'm like, it, it they're already kind of losing their their footing in, in what they've sort of set up here. Yeah, I mean, they couldn't even justify it as like the clothing on the ships were meant to be, you know, like military style clothing or anything like that because they were drab, they were dingy, you know, versus the opulent colors of everything that they had back in in Zion. Sure. It, right, you know, right. It, the, the dichotomy there really doesn't fit, and uh, it makes it harder. It's part of the reason I think why it made it harder for me to take that whole rave scene even seriously. Yeah. It's like, I understand what the rave scene was about. It's the celebration of humanity. It's to, you know, uh, rage against the dying light and everything like that. Whatever. Yeah. Which you easily could, and, you know, and the all important sex scene between uh, Trinity and Neo, <laughs> which had to be done. Yeah. I did, um, right. I mean, and again, they, I, I get the idea that the Wykowskis want to do something. I mean, they wanted this film to be very sexy. That's mm. obvious. You know, there's a lot of very sexy scenes in it. But again, it, it I thought it was kind of odd. Like, why do that whole big, sweaty, sexy rave scene? And then for some reason, Neo and Trinity are all over each other. Like, they haven't fooled around in months. But they sleep together. They sleep together uh, on the ship. They sleep together every single yeah. night. Yeah. So why are they acting like 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 he like he's he's just getting out of jail? <laughs> like I don't I don't quite get it. They, they didn't really explain that very it's well. Almost, you know, in uh, fact, you know what kind of was bothering me at this point in the film? I was thinking to myself, they took Trinity, who was a spectacular character, a strong, capable character, and and they really did dilute her into the love interest in this one. I mean, she gets some action scenes, but it's like she's making out constantly in this film. She's got to get rescued now for the first time. She's a jealous woman also. And I kind of hate that scene, by the way, but we'll get to it. Um, mm-hmm. it you know, I, I don't know. I just, yeah, like, like I kind of felt like she sort of got a short end of the stick this time around. I kind of agree with you, actually. I, I, I understand what it is they were trying to go for and everything like that. But I feel like this movie feels like a bunch of, I understand what you're trying to go for, but couldn't you have done it differently? Couldn't you have done it a yeah. little bit, like, here and there? Like, I understood the motivations of uh, uh, Persephone, the Monica Bellucci... <sighs> Monica Bellucci. The Monica Bellucci character. <laughs> um, I understood her motivations. I understood why she was looking for what she was looking for. And that and that's fine. I get it. But it just was so clunkily thrown in there yeah. that it just kind of felt, like, out of left field. Mm. I understood why the Merovogian was, you know, so pleased with the way the matrix was and stuff like that and how he took advantage of it. I got it, but it just, again, just felt clunky and felt out of place. Yeah, yeah. It's like they were trying these different themes. You know, you know, the thing is, the thing about this movie is it didn't stick with a consistent theme, just like it didn't stick with a consistent story. Now, if you have a theme that works, you can get away with the story being less than stellar. If you have a story that works, you can get away with having a less than stellar theme. Yeah. But if you have neither, what you have is um, an, 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 an immensely enjoyable and watchable movie, but a nonsensical one. It, right, yeah. It, right, I, I, right. It's, that's what I mean. It, it just seems so damn clunky. It's like when they were writing this script, it, it, it almost, fe- for, for as much that's in it, it still sort of has this kind of rushed feel to it. As if they're 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 banging the script out and they're saying everyone's gonna love this because it's got even more action and more philosophy and it's more brainy than the first one, you know. And it's like, yeah, yeah, but it just sort of comes off as like you know, sitting in your philosophy one on one class in school, being like, all right, yeah, I get it. We're you know, that's real deep. Yeah, it just it doesn't. And again, and seriously, I the big part of it I think that really sort of throws me off is that well, first of all. It kind of suffers from that. Like, like now Neo is the one, right? Yeah. So it's like he seems... It's almost like he's got the Clark Kent Superman thing going on where when he's not in the Matrix, he's a little more a little more toned down and he's a little more relatable. When he's in the Matrix, mm-hmm. it's like now he has to talk like like Morpheus and, and, yeah. and everyone has to speak like this and he has to have the sunglasses on 24-7 and constantly has to wear you know the big long coat. And, you know, it's like it's like the George Lucas take on on the prequels where it's like, this is how grownups talk because grownups are boring. We, we all have to talk like we're like we all we all have like giant rods stuck up our rear end. The whole thing, like now suddenly we have these cold, unrelatable characters. 
And I kind of felt like, but the first one wasn't like that. I, again, we had a perfect protagonist in Neo. You know, he was that perfect fish out of water sort of protagonist, and we're following him through the story. Now suddenly he's the one, so we can't relate to him anymore. Now suddenly he speaks in riddles and rhymes, and 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 everybody everybody's like you know, like they're doing their 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 philosophy thesis, and it's just like all right, I but like who who am I supposed to sort of relate to in this movie now? It, it's not Neo, at least I not that I can tell. And plus everyone else, ev- everyone they meet, and I I don't quite understand this. Like the people I felt like we met in the Matrix, even including what do you call it, the Oracle, like. She seemed like a person, a person who was just like the other people, except she's got a gift too, like the way Neo has a gift. Okay. Now, suddenly, everybody they meet are are programs. And I'm making the quote unquote mark with my fingers. They're now these quote unquote programs. Well, how does that work? And these, the, the Merovingian and these people and all, and the weird ghosty vampire thingies, um, like, like, there's no people in here anymore. Even the key master. I'm not really sure what he's supposed to be. Is he a regular guy? Is he another program? So it's like, it's almost like you sort of lose that. Well, who are we rescuing now? What is the point of all this? Like, I thought the whole point was that the people were, whether we knew it or not, we're all victims. We are all plugged into the matrix. We are all asleep and we need to rescue those people. Well, I don't see anybody in this. Like, I I feel like everyone in here is some sort of a weird thing like like this sort of hybrid people program something it's like we're in tron now instead of the matrix it's very disconnected with any form of humanity whereas the first one was very connected with humanity Mm. it 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 presents itself in a way that is almost like it's saying we have a lot to say about this subject uh and we have two movies to say it in so we're gonna stretch it out as much as possible and hopefully the additional questions that are brought up here will be answered in revolutions. The the there's just the problem is is that it, it become because it ends with the to be concluded little symbol at the end. Because it ends that way, yeah. it becomes it, it almost becomes kind of like one of your problems with Infinity War. Yes. That you know, you felt like it didn't really have a proper ending. Yeah. Which I disagreed with because I thought no, because we're, you're looking at it from the perspective of the heroes. When in technicality, this was a Thanos movie, and True. he had his beginning, middle, and end. He had his arc, which is you know, which was a full story. It just so happens that our good guys happen to be the background characters. That's where I think it worked. Here, the problem is it doesn't work. It does. It didn't really have a very good beginning, middle, and end. It didn't really explain itself. It. It, it, like, over-explained itself in so many areas and then forgot to explain itself in the areas that mattered the most. Yeah. It's like, yes, the, 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 scenes, the scenes with on the highway are outstanding. Right. The, the fight with the, the hundreds of, uh, of um, Smiths yeah. was really good. Yeah. You know, but there's no, real, there's no real good interconnection between that in either theme or story. That, that really makes it work. You know, you said to yourself, the key, the key master, okay, I under- we understand what the key master's, you know, what he does. He can open doors to anywhere within the Matrix. Mm-hmm. Yee. That's neat. I like that. Yeah, right. I would have liked to explore that a little bit more. Right. But we don't because he's dead by the end of the flick. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, suddenly, Agent Smith can f- put himself into any person within the Matrix, copy himself within the Matrix, and hey, look at that. He could even take himself out of the Matrix. Wow, we're really pushing the rules now. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's right. That is sort of my problem with this is that all the ground rules that that they set up in the first one, which, again, made it very relatable and understandable. And that was that was a tricky thing to do because you were inventing a whole universe, basically. Here, they just they just threw all the cards up in the air and says, look, wherever they land, they're going to land. This door opens to that. This door opens to that. Every everybody you meet is some kind of a funky program and has some sort of magical powers. So, so I mean, they, they, now they they're sort of just going off in fantasy world, um, and, and again, I, I don't, and I and the again, it's not that, I mean, the first one was a fantasy of sorts, but a fantasy with rules that you could you could understand. Now it's just like who, I don't care. It's like if I'll go with I'll, I'll go out that door and I'm in the Himalayas, whatever, you know. I I, I mean, even like when you get to the action scenes, like some of them were in there, like when you had Morpheus fighting the the, the agent on top of the truck. 
You know, and again, first of all, I mean, like you said, that truck scene is spectacular. It is absolutely spectacular. So I don't want to dig it too much. But there they are. They're fighting on top of the truck, doing all kinds of crazy wild things, right? And then like he'll he'll get to the edge and be like, whoa, like he's gonna like he's like like he's about to fall off. And I'm sort of saying to myself, am I supposed to care about that? Are you gonna get hurt now if you fall? I mean, I'm watching you do the all kinds of wild, crazy things. Why am why am I supposed to care that you're on the edge going whoa like like I'm gonna fall off? I mean, it, it almost it's almost kind of like the um like in the prequels where I felt like it like in the first few minutes of Phantom Menace where like you know when they sort of do like the, the high speed Jedi speed running which yeah. which you never see again and then there's like the shots later in the other movies where they're in the cars flying around and he just jumps out of the cars and he's falling whatever where it's almost like mm-hmm. like like are, are Jedi superheroes now? Like, like, are they just sort of magical and can do all kinds of like crazy, like, like they're, they're so crazy now that I, I don't know. Am I supposed to care about the rules? Am I supposed to, to, to really be like worried? Well, he's going to fall down and get hurt. What's the difference? I mean, he'll just bounce and flip and do something or other. I don't know. So, but yeah, so, I mean, that's the thing. I, you really just have no ground rules in this movie. So you really can't get a handle on anything. It's it's much more about style and spectacle than anything you can really genuinely relate to, and they try to sort of make up for that with all the philosophy and and not for nothing, I do feel like that stuff works if you really kind of, I mean you you shouldn't have to think about it as much as you do, so so it fails it, it's totally a fail but it's frustrating because there is something in there I mean the idea that you know Morpheus says we have choice no we don't. It, I mean, they all start to say, like, is everything inevitable? And even the conversation later with the architect, which, again, one of the most boring, stupid, frankly, scenes ever, because you, you you've, I, I feel like that was done so poorly. You know, like, like what a weak way to, to just just babble up exposition so boringly. There had to be had to have been something better they could have done. But they do sort of bring up the point. Morpheus is fighting for the idea that we are, we're free, our minds are free, we have free will, and we do everything based on our own choices. And the Merovingians, no, you don't. This cause will happen, you will respond accordingly, you don't really, you think you have a choice, but you don't. And it's almost like, and when they get to the point with, with the architect... Which brings us at last to the moment of truth wherein the fundamental flaw is ultimately expressed and the anomaly revealed as both beginning and end there are two doors the door to your right leads to the source and the salvation of Zion the door to your left leads back to the matrix to her and to the end of your species as you adequately put the problem is choice but we already know what you are going to do don't we you can go out that door door number one you save Zion door number two you save Trinity right is he really making a conscious decision there? Not really, because like uh, like the Oracle says, you already made the choice. You are who you are. You're going to do what you're going to do. Was was he ever not going to go through the door to save Trinity? No. Like, there really wasn't another choice for him. So, in that respect, the things that they're exploring in this are worth exploring. But like I said, but they sort of just sort of come at you like a, like a, you know, like a big dead weight, you know, like here. Here's the philosophy. Eat it, eat it, and let's move on to the action. So it, again, it just doesn't work. It doesn't have if they if they work the script better, a little more finesse, work it into into the action as opposed to just doing set pieces and then philosophy pieces. Then you would have had something. They're boring from the surface straight down to Zion. There is only one way to save our city. Neo. The big reveal in this movie is that Neo is the sixth one. And I found that to be fascinating. I thought, that is such a clever idea. The idea that basically the Matrix couldn't exist without at least the artificiality of choice. But the problem with choice is that eventually it breaks down the code of the matrix and you basically have to reboot that's what the one is from yeah, a computer yeah. from a computer guy side of things i dig that i think that's freaking awesome yeah. but it's presented in a very like almost condescending way like 
I, I, I have nothing against the actor who played the architect, but because yeah. he presented it like he was, because he had, and he had to obviously, he was obviously told to do it that way, because he came across as a condescending prick, it kind of feels like if you don't get what he's saying, you're a moron. And, <laughs> yeah. And right. I kind of feel bad for right. some, the movie for does some right. The movie is very self-important this time around. And I, I remember remember saying when we talked about the last one, it, it didn't give itself time to, to sit there and be so self, self-congratulatory. self You know, yeah. this, this does have a... Are. Yeah, this does have a very masturbatory feel. Look, you know, we're we're, we're, we're let's take the time to smell our own farts because because we 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 re, look how smart we are. Right, there is a lot of that in this, and and frankly, you bring up a good point. If the architect, I mean, what the architect is basically saying is that everything has been designed so that there would be someone who is the one who I guess because he is so self-aware, because they've gotten to a point of of being too self-aware, like you said, now we sort of have to hit the reset button and try it again. Okay, well then why? Does do we need the architect to come in and sit down and, and explain these things to Neo? What does he get out of that? Why does he take the time to talk to Neo and explain to him all? It's like it's like the magician does his trick and then he's going to sit you down and explain to you exactly how he did the trick. Well, why? What, what's the point of that? Why, if I'm the architect and I've I've programmed this thing to run so smoothly that, that even the glitches are really there just to just to self correct, right? Why bring attention to it? Why why shine a spotlight on it? Just let Neo do his thing, go blow up Zion and start all over again if, if that's the point. So I'm I'm not really understanding why why that, that scene is there, why we need it's almost like, it's like the villain in the Bond movies where he you know rubs his hands together and says, Now I'll tell you what my evil plan was, right before I put you in a trap that you're going to escape from. I kind of feel like that's this in this movie. This is the scene where the where the evil mastermind tells you his plan and then lets you go off and, and do what you're gonna do. So again, I'm not understanding what that's what that's for. The problem is, is because the reveal of the one being a typical thing that happens in the system every so many so many years, uh, because it was given to us at the last minute, because it was given to us in such a way where we, as the audience, knew there was no chance that he was walking into the other door to to save Zion. Right. That we knew, we knew there was no chance of that. Sure. From the first shot of the movie, set the tone of that choice, yeah. which could be brilliant or could be like condescending. Um, the unfortunate side of it is, is because of the tone of the rest of the movie and the rest of the scenes that happens, it came across as condescending. And once you start talking down to your audience, you lose them. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how many cars you blow up or how many guy white guy white albino twins you you know have ghost into the into another car and have a fight scene in yeah. the back seat. Yeah. That all that stuff's not going to matter. You're not going to they're not going to fall for the velocity. It took me maybe a year of retrospect once both of these movies were done to get what they were going and I was like, "Okay, I got it. I did." And just because I get it doesn't make it better. Exactly. Bingo. Right. Right, they they they've kind of done this thing where if you sit around long enough, you can sort of crack the code and figure out what they were going for. But even then, it doesn't matter. Does that make it a good story? No. I mean, again, no, you you didn't. I if I have to watch this movie twenty times before I get it, you failed. You failed. I mean, I, I if I have to read a book twenty times again, I'm not <laughs> I'm not the smartest guy in the world. It might take me a couple times to get it. But I, but if it takes me that long then maybe you have done something wrong in your explanation. So, right, just because that, that stuff is there, if if you dig deep enough, doesn't mean that they did a good job with it. Like I said, I mean, no. it's, it's it's action piece, philosophy piece, action piece. Philo- and, it, yeah, it's it's just really clunky. The whole beginning with the, I mean, the, the part where after the rave, Neo can't sleep, so he gets up, and the president is there right the, mm-hmm. the anthony zerby whatever his name is um yeah, the head of the council yeah yeah he's there and they have this long boring and it's funny like <laughs> they're sitting there looking over zion okay talk 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 and then he says something about the uh the engineering room do you ever see it let's go look at it and they go to another railing and look over and, <laughs> and they say isn't this great? okay like the view the view changed look like it looks no different to me it looks, it's just more you know CGI 
you know, room, whatever, and they just keep the conversation going. I'm like, why did why did you have to go to a different room for that? I'm not I don't get any difference from it. Um Oh, Joe, it's the message. Don't you get the message? The message is coexistence. The machines and the people, they need each other, no, Joe. I, right, I that, got that. But the that's, conver- what the, but, that's what it's all about. But the conversation could have started in the engineering room if, if we wanted to talk about that. That big bloated conversation that takes I don't know how long could have been condensed into 30 seconds. I would have got the point. They, 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 that's what I'm saying. There's so much as blah, 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 blah. It's like, you know, all right already. There's there's a difference between trusting your audience and condescending to your audience, or at the very least, I mean, we see that's really what it is. I don't necessarily know if this is the Wachowski brothers just uh, being unable to trust the audience and felt that they had to pad it, or that they truly, really felt ah, American audiences are dumb. They 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 think there is no spoon and stuff like that, and that's what they get from the Matrix. We want to we want to blow their minds. We want to expand their philosophy. I don't know exactly if that was their goal. One of the things they did when they signed up to do the sequel is they made it clear that they're not going out to do interviews. So they've never really spoken publicly about any of the things with regards to this movie mm. at all. They they just kind of let it stand the way it is. Sure. So they didn't even defend the, the choices that they make nor justify the choices that they make. But it came across as way more preachy than they prop. Then I'm, I'm going to go with it came across more preachy than they really wanted it to be. That they were just trying to do something to expand, you know, the audience's mind, but in inadvertently spoke down to the audience and turned off the audience because of that. Yeah, and honestly, I mean, I don't even know if preachy is the right word. I know what you're saying, um, but I kind of. I just feel like they they sort of felt that they were sort of put in a corner and they were sort of saying, look, we we did something once that blew people's minds. If we just do more of the same, then we're not blowing anybody's minds anymore. So they had to up it another notch. Um, I mean, to the point where at the end, I, I like I still to this day don't get the thing where he comes out of the Matrix. The squiddies are coming to get him. The the Sentinels. And he bzz, zaps the Sentinels. Yeah. When he's not in the Matrix. Right. I don't get that. I don't understand it at all. That makes I, I no don't, sense to I me. Don't, I, I mean, but that it to was me basically like, I think set that's sort up of what for sequel. I mean, it was basically meant to be set up for sequel, but I don't remember Revolutions actually explaining how he was able to do that in the real world. I, I don't either. I, I don't either. And But again, I. it's almost like... <coughs> it's almost like... A, it's, I'm looking at that saying... All right, look, is, is the whole point of this that even though we think we're awake, we're still in the Matrix? I like it was almost, that was sort of the impression I was I was getting. Like, are they are they trying to tell me and again, with the architect's speech and with all this stuff going on with Smith and yada yada, it's almost like I'm I'm saying to myself, are they trying to tell me that the Matrix is so good that even when you think you woke up, you didn't? Where, where it's almost like an Inception vibe, where you're waking up from one dream just sort of into the other level of the same dream, you know? Like I was, I, it was almost like that was what I would thought they were trying to go for, but I, but by the time you get to the sequel, it's like, all right, no, it's that's not it. So uh, what is it? You know, like I'm not now, I'm not getting it. So like that, that one, that part really sort of took me out of the whole, the whole thing. I mean, when we see, when we watch Revolutions and we get our reminder, because I don't think you and I have seen either of the sequels no. probably since they came out. So we're talking like a 16-year uh, uh, difference yeah. now, 15, that, 16 years difference. Yeah, I mean, it was honestly kind of funny because I, as I was watching this one, I remember thinking, like, I honestly can't remember what happened in which one. Like, like the two the two sequels sort of blended together. So I, I, I kind of almost didn't know what to expect from this one. I couldn't tell. I, I, was, it, was this from this one or that one? So, yeah. Um, and I like I said, I don't remember the sequel answering a lot of the questions from this one. So, But, but again, we'll talk about that next week. Yeah. So I, I, feel, I, I feel the setup that they did with Agent Smith. I, and again, I'm not saying I agree with the choice. I'm not saying I think this is a cool idea or anything like that. I'm just going with what I feel they were trying to say. I feel like the introduction of the idea that Smith can imprint himself outside of the Matrix into uh, the Bane character. And wow, what a coincidence he just happens to pick a character with an awesome name like Bane. <laughs> right. Yeah. 
<laughs> you think he's going to be but, a bad but, guy? But, I yeah, but, but but that aside, so they introduced that, and now they're trying to say that in some ways, and this is what I feel like they're trying to say. They're trying to say that, in a weird way, the world of the Matrix and the, uh, the world of reality are, are semi-interchangeable. And what you do in one can be passed over to the other and vice versa, which is a huge, you know, idea and an interesting philosophical discussion. But I don't think they really got to the point in the conversation where they really explained that very well. No. And I don't think they got to the point in the conversation in this movie and potentially in the sequel that justified it. It's just it now becomes it becomes Doctor Strange. It becomes the nano, uh, the nanobot um, Iron Man armor. You know, it's right, just, right. Oh, it, it, it's the Matrix, and that's it. Yeah, that's right. All you need to just do. a right, just a cinematic convenience. But again, I right. Why why do that? Why break all the rules rules you set up in the first one unless there's a big payoff? The really and don't... excellent and well laid ground rules, right? No less. Exactly. Yeah, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't get it at all. I mean, and all the stuff with Smith, frankly. I, I remember the first time I watched it, and I still feel it today, I feel like the only reason why he is in it doing the things he's doing is because they said, how can we not have Hugo Weaving in the sequel? So, yeah. so they had to bring him back in some way or another, and they, they do this high, convoluted way of, of explaining away what he is, why he's back, and why he still has a boner to kill Neo. Um yeah, that never worked for me either. I I felt like that was you're, you're now you're just, you're you're just writing silliness to, you know. And again, they, they and they were like, hey, everyone likes Hugo weaving in this part. Let's have more Hugo weaving in this part. So I kind of felt like I was I, I was okay with it, but eh. and again, I mean, now this guy can, I mean, not only does he does he make more of himself, not only does he, do regular people become. The Hugo Weaving, the Agent Smiths, but now even agents can be turned into whatever by Agent Smith. I mean, if it, actually, if you think about it, Smith is has is frankly more powerful than Neo. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, if Neo could just walk up to agents and be like Buzz and turn them into Neos, well, we we fix the whole the whole <laughs> that you, you'd end the war that way. Uh, yes, pretty much. Um, I do kind of feel like this was definitely a case of they they were doing some kind of pandering to bring him back. I don't think it was worthy. I don't think they should have. I think that Hugo Weaving did an excellent job in the first one, and they should have just stuck with that. Yeah. Um, I feel like they wrote themselves... It's like we discussed last week. They kind of wrote themselves into a corner yeah. when it came to that last scene where he took off in flight. It's like, well, now he needs to have... Now that we know that he can fly, yeah. when he needs to have a threat... A bigger right. threat that that the flying doesn't matter, and, they, and yeah, when when they shoot him now, when he can stop the bullets in midair, right. like there's like that that fight scene by the way after the Merovingian scene, which is actually very good by the way. I really do like that fight scene. I thought that was really well done. And the, and the stairs, yes, yeah, that was a beautiful, very fight. cool scene. I mean, again, it feels like fluff now because it feels like it's not really ingrained in the in the overall story. But whatever. I mean, when they get to the part when they they all fire the machine guns at him, and he, he just puts his hand out and stops the bullets dead, right? Mm-hmm. I'm saying to myself, and then they they just run at him and he fights them. Well, why don't you just put your hand out and stop the people? If you can stop a bullet, then why can't you stop a person who's just running at you? You know, I I, I, I again, but but we're supposed to also believe that these people who he's fighting are again advanced, not quite people. People, they're they're the, these programmy hybrids. So again, like I said, everyone in this world now is is just another program. So it's really start like I said, it's starting to get more like Tron than than than, than the Matrix. <laughs> um, and incidentally, by the way, I kind of felt like that whole thing with the vampires and werewolves and stuff. That's really a glitch in the Matrix. I was like, yeah, no, come on, because I mean that's that's a real. I I, I don't know. You're, you're you're now you're going to sort of pull actual folklore into the Matrix and sort of call it a real thing, I mean, which again sort of goes to what I was saying about fantasy worlds. It's it's like it's like oh remember the things from Alice in Wonderland yeah they actually exist in this world because they're glitches of the Matrix mm, no yeah. well actually the funny part is I actually like the idea behind that but I didn't see the point right it's like oh you know the you know the the things that go bump in the night those are glitches in the Matrix oh okay I'd like to know more about this mm. and it was all. Just for setup for the Merovogians or Merovogian yes. or however the fuck you pronounce it, pardon <laughs> my language. I'm gonna say that again. For the Merovogian or however the heck you pronounce it. Yeah. 
Uh, it was just set up for his bodyguards to do those cool things that the bodyguards did. And I kind of feel like, well, that's not really enough. Why, right, right. why, I mean, they, why they, bring up this interesting concept if you're not going to show it in more? And I don't believe they show it anymore in the third movie either. No, I mean, I, I feel like the only reason they even mention that at all is because when she shoots them in the head and she makes the comment about having silver bullets, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, okay, uh, werewolves, silver bullets, I get it. <laughs> but, it's like, but it's like, uh... I mean, is that where we're? I mean, will they turn into actual werewolves if we hang around here long enough? I don't know. I, I just I, like again. It's. I mean, the overall the point is that it, they they blend this sort of fantasiness with with the reality that they had set up, and the cocktail doesn't work. It, it's it just makes the whole thing feel like I can't relate to anything. It, it's all spectacle. I can't feel anything because it's it all is just fantasy in the end. Um, right. None of it makes Overblown sense. Overblown fantasy. Overblown you know, not fantasy. Even, not, right. And, and again, not, every, and, not even and honestly, trying. I feel like every single action scene, as good as they are, they all feel just like set pieces. They, they, they just stuck it in here and there and not for any really good reason. I mean, even, even the scene where the guy, I mean, th- this is like, like they're not even trying at this point. When he goes to see the Oracle, right? Mm. Which he has done before. They, they pulled up to the door, they knock on the door, they walk in. Now suddenly he has to go through through these weird dimensions, time and space, whatever, meeting the guy in the dojo, sitting there drinking tea, and he says he needs to just fight him for no reason. And like this big, long, <coughs> three-minute fight scene happens, and he goes, eh, stop. That's Okay. Yeah, we're, we're done here. Right. <laughs> I think that's enough. We can move on. <laughs> and he takes him to see the Oracle. Why? Why? Did, why did that turn into a thing? And again, a fight scene for literally for no reason, N- no reason at all, and it wasn't even very good. It was it was okay, it was fine, but I mean, when you when you see all the other fight scenes in this in this movie, that just feels like an appetizer, like it's not even a very good one. No, it wasn't. It was that, honestly, that was the weakest fight throughout the entire movie. I mean, it really, and, I mean, it wasn't really like a like an actual set piece. It was just kind of like, oh, let's fight for for thirty seconds and then stop and and move along. Okay. <laughs> You have new additions to the cast. You've got some kid called, who's just called the kid. I don't know what the hell he's there for. Oh, yeah, yeah. You've got Jada Pinkett Smith yeah. as Niobe. And again, uh, just there for conflict purposes, I, I suppose. You've got Commander Locke. You've got uh, Commander Mufuni. Actually, if I remember correctly, Commander Mufuni has a really cool, you know, uh, thing that happens in the third movie. So. Mm-hmm. I, 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 if I remember correctly, I'm not 100 percent sure, but um, and of course named after the uh, uh, late great Toshiro Mifune from the um, Christ Joe Japanese director Rashomon. Oh, uh, Kurosawa. Thank you, Jesus <laughs> brain. Yes, you y- you have all these additional uh, additions to the cast that you know really don't bring anything new to the table. The show pieces, while beautiful and well staged, are literal cut and paste and what i mean by cut and paste like you could have put them at any point in the movie and it would have worked because there was no build up to that i mean honestly just from from the moment that um monica bellucci shot the quote-unquote vampires or 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 uh, uh werewolves or whatever the hell those guys were forward that was the only moment in the movie that actually followed a linear path we came for the key master Miracle Game came after us. He sends his ghost after us. We split up. Neo fights one half. They're trying to get away with the key mess. Mm. That was about the only linear part of the entire movie that made sense to me. The rest of it is just disjointed. Yeah. I think is the best way of describing this movie. Yeah. It's not a terrible movie, but it is a disjointed movie. Yeah. And I'll tell you, and even to what you just said about how that played out, at least it pl- at least it played out linearly because you knew they had to go here and then go there and then go there. But even that was, again, like, how do you, who's writing this where he, okay, he goes to the Oracle and she says, well, you're going to have to go to the key master and then you're going to have to do this then you have to do that. Oh, so, so that's what they do. Well, again, that's, that's almost like a choose your own adventure at that point where it's like, well, I mean, there's no why. Well, why do I have to get, go to the key master? Because he's going to give you a key to go where? To go into a building that's that's downtown. Well, why do I need why do I need a whole guy for that? Can I get into into the building? I broke into a building before with machine guns. Why do I need them? I I don't know. I mean, again, it's it's you can't. And again, I'm sure if I sat here with a diagram and and pieced everything together, I could figure this out or put it all together. But it's like, but I don't want to. I I don't. Why does it have to be that complicated? And why why do you why are you going to write silly things into? 
I, the, the, the key master to get you from here to there because you, uh, whatever. And then who, again, who is he? Why, why is there a key master in the matrix whose sole purpose is to write it is to make a key to get into a place? Well, why would that? I don't know. I mean, it's almost like it's, it's like when every, every time somebody asks anybody, who are you and why are you here? I find that to be a very logical, reasonable question. And the answer is always, I am who I am. And I do, we all do the things that we are going to do. And yeah, it's like, it's, it's like F off, you know, <laughs> like that's like, come on, don't talk that. Like, that's, that's when you're talking to me, like I'm five years old sitting on grandpa's lap, e either, either explain this or don't, don't say stupid things like that. Just to sort of wash over the question. I mean, again, it's like, it's a reasonable question. Why, why is this person here? What is the function? Why, who would he be if we weren't here? Just because the Oracle said to be here. I it's I mean it's almost like the, the Oracle now has become this this plot shortcut where anything she says because she says it, just do that and, and that's the story. You know, like like go here, go there, and then go there. Which by the way goes against the entire idea of choice that this movie is trying to get across. Right. Exactly. I mean it's it does right. And and again, like I said, they're they're playing with things that are interesting if you if you if you took the time to flesh it out. And and by the yeah. And you're right. I, I kind of feel like every time they cut back to Zion, by the way, and they're arguing about what they're going to do, military this, the too, too many ships here and there. Again, now I kind of feel like the Matrix has now become Star Trek in a way. And, yeah. and by the way, that Locke character, I really he was really miscast. I felt like he was yeah. terrible. I really felt like he was not. They really needed like a big, like like a like almost like that the, the mean old general from like uh, Avatar. You know, they needed like a big, mean military kind of guy. This guy looks like he sells shoes. I don't, he, I don't know. There's something about him just didn't fit. I didn't really think he was a good fit for the for for that role. I kind no, of it's no, almost like, like, like they should they should have had like a bigger, badder Morpheus. You know, instead of a guy who's mm. kind of like a milk toast version of Morpheus. So any and by the way, too again, I really thought talking about we were talking before about like the pre the pretentiousness of the film. Um. Mm. Every time now that they cut to these new characters in the Matrix, I kind of felt like, like, like I said, they, they took what they started and they just went too far with it. Now, all these people are like, as soon as they get into the Matrix, now they're all wearing these funky, weird leather outfits and funky this. Everybody's in a dark room with sunglasses and it just looks 10 times more out of place in this one. Like, why would you do that? Why? And every, if I swear to God, every time I would see Morpheus walking around with his hands locked behind him, Jesus, that was annoying. Like, what is that for? Put your hands to your, well, like, is that some like funky Zen thing? No, nobody does. I've never seen like any, any like Zen master walk around with his arms behind him like that. Come on. <coughs> it's like, like, they now, like you said, they are, they're getting into areas of, of pretentiousness and it just looks so stupid. What if the prophecy is true? What if tomorrow the war could be over? Isn't that worth fighting for? Isn't that worth dying for? And speaking of pretentiousness, it's time for us to have a little pretension and <laughs> score this son of a god. <laughs> After I railed on self-importance for 45 minutes, watch me be self-important. Um, <laughs> but only for five minutes. <laughs> yeah. I will say this. I really did think I thought going into this that I was going to be scoring this as a really subpar film. But I I have to admit, though, even for all the complaining I'm doing, I found myself enjoying it a lot more than I did, primarily because I thought the action scenes, which I really thought were going to look very outdated at this point, they really held up. And even mm. the, the fight, the, the fight with the Smiths, which I thought for sure I was going to look at and think it was so silly, it really did seem to hold up. I really did enjoy the hell out of it. I thought the music, when the music kicks in, it's they they really went full force with this like pounding beat, and mm -hmm. you know, and I thought like I was like wow, that really does work, and I was really enjoying all of it. Um, I was even willing to forgive the sound effects of the bowling pins and the dominoes falling. Um, I didn't get that, but yes, go on. I, you know, it's funny. I, you know, I, I'd heard people. I, it's been pointed out to me the bowling pin sound effect, but as I was watching it this time, there was actually another sound effect that sounded like dominoes falling. 
Um, uh, it, it, there was. I yeah. looked it up. It was definitely that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and I, and again, I kind of get that. I, I think they were trying to make it so subtle that you, whether you like, you just sort of think you heard it, or you, you didn't really pick it up, whatever. Um, anyway, so the action scene, the, the fight in the stairwells was spectacular. Um, even if I didn't think it was completely logical, it was still really well done. The, mm-hmm. again, the freeway scene is amazing. And again, they are getting into very interesting themes. This film had a script with a lot of potential. Do we do things? Do we really have choice or are we basically programmed to do things? I mean, we all do. I mean, how many of us have very self-defeating habits? It was like that line in the movie, by the way, now that I'm in uh, Annihilation, which was a great line. W- oh, yeah. About I and I, I'm gonna ruin this because I can't remember it exactly, but it was something about you know there's a difference between suicidal and being um, self defeating. Like we all have very self defeating tendencies, and again, why do we do that? I don't know. We're just sort of hardwired to do some of these things, and and we do them. We think we have conscious choice, but do we really? We do a lot of things out of habit that we can't really explain, and the you know they again they started to explore that in this film. But again, it wasn't worked into the story. It, it, they would pause from doing action scenes to sit and have a conversation. I mean, again, we're, we're almost talking like prequel scripting here. <laughs> we're, you know, sitting on a couch, sitting on a couch, sitting on a couch. Like here, I mean, again, they walk in, they're sitting at the table, just having a conversation across the table for a long length of time. And then they walk again, walking into the room with the architect, with the screens behind them. Because we, well, that's okay. It's a gimmick. It's it's something to do, but it, at the end of the day, it's just two people sitting there talking, 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 talking. Uh, again, the first one did it with a sense of mastery, where everything was conveyed along with some action or along with 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 the, a progression in the story. So yeah, anyway, it's a mixed bag. It's a clunky bag, but I I I did enjoy watching it again, and I actually am surprised that I am kind of looking forward to next week i know it's not i know it's going to be a, a disappointment a let down. Yeah. but i'm not dreading watching it by any stretch so i'm gonna give it a seven and like i said i really didn't know where i was headed with this i my score in my mind watching it was sort of all over the grid so yeah i'm gonna settle on a seven and say it is worth watching it's not it's, it's not the banner film that the first one was it's definitely not perfect like the first one but it's worth your time so i'll give it a seven and your dynamic scoring as the movie progressed made sense. We've spoken a great deal about how this movie just kind of went up and down and flipped and changed tonally and changed storily as it was going along with no seeming rhyme or reason. So, of course, the score going up and down makes absolute positive sense. Now, for me, I was as, as much as we spent when we spent the entire hour pretty much talking about what is wrong with this movie. We very rarely hit something we thought and came out and said that was cool and if we did we did it very very briefly so i kind of feel like my summation is this podcast itself what i need to do is justify why i also gave it a seven and i gave it a seven because i enjoyed it and i found myself compelled to the end and i found myself liking where it tried to go as opposed to where it should have gone or could have gone And I, like you, am looking forward to next week's uh, movie now because I'm kind of, I I guess a part of me is hoping like, you know what, maybe 16 years of growth makes the difference and maybe I'll appreciate it more this time around as opposed to when we first saw it and we didn't really know what to expect. Exactly. I agree. So I I was very surprised and I I had fun. I had a lot of fun. I mean, I, I... I just want to know the name of the person who had to get Carrie Ann Moss into those those pants because there's this one shot, there's this one shot, and I just I watched it and I was like, whoa, where she straddles the Ducati, the motorcycle on top of the thing, and when I say that 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 those latex pants go <laughs> right the hell up there, yeah, she I she pulled like, that off, <laughs> so to speak, wow. But but that entire sequence is also outstanding. There's a lot of outstanding ideas. There's a lot of good about this movie that I really, really enjoyed, and I was happy to have watched. But it's flawed, and we've discussed the flaws, 
And now we're going to talk about who asked you. Mm. Ah, who's going to go first here? <laughs> there are nitpicks that I could go with throughout this entire movie. I mean, I could make fun of that four minute and 31 second uh, rave. And yes, I totally timed it. I, I even <laughs> wrote it in my notes. Timestamp 2726 to 3107. Not a prude. I get what you're trying to do, but you could have done it in a minute, not four minutes and 31 seconds. Mm. That was my note on that one. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't really want to bag on it because that kind of feels like an easy target, you know, because it is kind of a relatively ridiculous scene. So I'm going to say I really would have done the entire architect scene differently. I feel like this was the crux of the movie. This was the part of the movie that should have justified all the crap that we just went through previously. And to be basically sat down and spoken to like a petulant child or like a dog that just crapped on the floor. Because that's, that's how it came across to me. And to be spoken to in a way that just didn't feel honest with, with the way the rest of the movie and the way the rest of the philosophy was explained in the first one. You totally shifted between the two movies. And then you completely took the tone of this movie, threw that out the window with the introduction of the architect and his explanation as to what's going on. There's a great idea in what that explanation was. And I don't know how I would have done it differently, hindsight being 2020, but I feel like that scene reshaped could have made this movie better. That's just my own opinion. Yeah, and, I, and I'm with you. I, I definitely agree with that one. I, I, I Again, it's, it's confusing. Once they start getting into bringing these characters in who are quote-unquote programs or something, well, why, why are they in people form? Why is the, is the architect, who I assume is a machine... Why mm-hmm. is he sitting there in the form of a of a crusty old man in a suit talking to Neo and telling him things that the machine doesn't need Neo to know? Unless again, unless there's something I'm not getting, unless there's another layer somewhere <laughs> where, where he's he's actually leading Neo to do something that he wants him to do. Yeah, I, I agree with you. That was very clunky and weird. And for my who asked you, and it's funny too. I you know a lot of times when we do the who asked you, I sort of forget that the point of it is how would we do it differently. Yeah, you know, same here. sometimes I sort of just pick out my least favorite or or just most you know egregious offensive scene and say that's that's the worst offender and that's the one I would chop off. Well, in the in the spirit of that, the, the the one scene that I would just lop it off and say no, we don't need it. Uh, I'm gonna go with the exploding vagina pie. <laughs> Like, oh, <laughs> I know what they were trying to say with that, but my God, that was embarrassing. Yeah, almost. exactly. Come on, guys. It's like, <laughs> and again, like, you know, like, we, like, like you said, I'm not a prude. I'm really not. But what is the point of that? What is the point of that? It, it, it just, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And again, why is the... Why is the Merovingian, again, I don't know who he is. How does he have these capabilities to create these things? I don't get it. That's the one I would just have gotten rid of. When it comes to how I would have changed something or done it better, the scene, and I alluded to it before, when Monica Bellucci's character wants a kiss from Neo. She says, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll do it, but I want a kiss. And what does Trinity do? Pulls, up, pulls up a gun. How about a bullet instead? Right now, I saw that and I cringed. I cringed because you you created this very smart, capable, tough character. Okay, mm-hmm. who and, doesn't need Neo? Right. Who doesn't? She d- absolutely positively does not need Neo to exist. Exactly. Right. Now suddenly she reacts like she's a junior varsity cheerleader. Somebody's got, somebody's going to, but, but they try to do it in this way where they think it's, again, they think it's so cool. You know, she's, she's going to react like a jealous teenager, but she's going to do it in a cool badass way where she pulls her gun out. No, that is not how you write that character. No, this, I'm sorry, but this, this woman who, like I said, smart, tough, capable, etc., is not going to cringe and bridle and 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 get all upset because somebody's kissing on her man. It's just a kiss. Get over it. Deal with it and stop acting like a baby. They really did that character a disservice. And again, like with I said, she, scene, she really yeah. did sort of they they really did relegate her 
to being the love interest in this film. And I, I, it's a little disappointing. I mean, not that she didn't get a couple fight scenes, not that she didn't get a couple bike riding scenes, whatever. She did fine, but again, that was cringy. I'm sorry, and 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 you you really did not do that character justice with that particular scene. Agreed. Well, Joe, how about for your consideration? Um. Well, again, I kind of going back on what I said before. I hate to just sort of pull out the coolest scenes in the movie and say that's the one. But, um, and I, I'm going to avoid the obvious one. The highway scene is phenomenal, you know, very well done, very cool to watch. I mean, there's, I mean, and again, there's a lot of CGI in this movie that they rely on for a lot of things, but I'm watching a lot of real cars flying around on that freeway. And a lot of that Ducati is flying in between a lot of cars. And I know they might've inserted or done some, some things, but that is some pretty cool stunts. Um, but the one that I kind of walked away with this time around that I kind of went, wow, I forgot how good that was, was the, the fight on the stairways. Mm. That fight scene was really spectacular. I really was enjoying the hell out of that when it happened. Um, it's very well done, extremely well choreographed. You know where everyone in, in that room is. Everyone is moving. Like there's no kind of you know, weird pauses where this one has to hang out for, for the, for, you know, for a second or two over here so he can fight this guy. And then he, just, I mean, I kind of felt like the whole thing was really crafted. Well, it was, it was a really, really brilliantly choreographed scene. And I really enjoyed the hell out of it. I agree, man. I, my, one of my favorite shots is where Neo is on the, the left-hand side of the screen and the three of them, you've got one that's jumping up and it's in slow motion. Yes. You've got another one that's jumping over. And the third one is just kind of walking sideways across, just yeah. trying to get over to him. That is one of my favorite shots in the movie. I totally so agree with you. That, that was, one. yeah, a really noticeable, good shot. Totally. How about you, well, my friend? I, 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 for me, I, 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 I agree with you that taking the, uh, the highway scene, the highway scene is maybe one of the best action sequences ever directed in a movie. And the fact that they built like a two mile stretch of highway to film it is to me, Freaking beautiful. Yeah. I, I love that. That, that like, when people say, oh, this movie cost $150 million, uh, million dollars to do, I'm like, oh, where is it? There is no doubt as this movie progresses where that money went. Yeah. And a lot of it was practical. The fact that they built a practical highway just for that stuff, I love that. That's amazing stuff to me. To me, I think the thing that I liked the most, the thing that I took away from this that surprised me, the one that I think is, here, here's, here's here, I'm going to explain it. My name is Ryan Johnson, and I'm going to subvert your expectations as to what uh, The Last Jedi is after uh, The Force Awakens. And we know how that turned out. <laughs> right. Whereas at the end of The Matrix, it's like, ah, okay, so Neo is Superman, so he's going to save the day, he's going to save all the people and stuff like that. They took that, and I think, I feel like the, the idea that there is multiple ones, that they've done this before, that basically all Neo is is a glitch in the Matrix, that once it gets purged, they should just start the whole thing over again. As a computer guy, I thought that was brilliant. I thought that that was... That's, that is subverting expectations without diminishing the power of the first movie or the character, I felt. Mm. Okay? It was told terribly. But when I was able to finally piece together all of that, you know, months after, I thought that's really smart that because it in a, in a way it like yes it progressed the story yes it, it 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 only slightly diminished him but not completely and it added a whole new wrinkle to the idea of whoa what the hell mm. i liked that and i felt like you know damn the torpedoes for them not getting it across better than they did but i really appreciated that they tried and i felt that in a way it with the weird part I felt like that was a logical way. If you're gonna, if you were just doing one sequel, you could have just gone, you know, oh, blah 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 blah. But the fact that they were doing two sequels back to back, that was a good way of moving the plot forward for a third movie. Now, whether that pays off in the in the long run is a different matter. I just felt it was a brilliant idea. I'm with you. I'm with you. Like I like summed it up perfectly. Ex executed a little shabbily, but the 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 idea pretty good. Which is, unfortunately, the shortcoming of this movie. This movie is a great idea with some very interesting, poor choices when it comes to presentation. Yeah. 
I, I agree. I, and I and I go back to what I said in, in, in my opening. I it feels it feels to me like a stew, but they forgot to chop and mince and and blend and stir. It's it's all the right ingredients, but just kind of. I'm going to interrupt you for a second because when you first started saying that analogy, I meant to say that earlier. You said you put in sirloin. And I was like, well, Joe, actually, sirloin is not good for a stew. <laughs> is that Sometimes, right? and no, it's true. You, you want a, you want a uh, lesser cut of beef because it's going to be braising in the gravy. That's what's going to give it its flavor. You want something with fattiness to actually blend out into your stew to give it even more flavor. Mm. A cut of meat like a sirloin is not really good for a stew. So I felt your analogy was even more spot on than you thought because it was like, <laughs> ah, yes, lofty ideas, but really probably didn't belong here. <laughs> oh, no, I, I meant to do that. I meant that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell yourself that. Okay, good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the year is slowly coming to an end, and we are on our last last movie of a series. We've done a lot of series this year, and yeah. this is the last last movie of a series that we're doing, because next week we're going to close out the Matrix era, which was a very quick era. I mean, it was only three years. Mm. The first one came out in 99, and these sequels came out in 2003. Next week, we will record The Matrix Revolutions. So until next time, good night, ladies and gentlemen. Good night, my man. See you next week. Thanks for listening to the Reviews Without Remorse podcast with Joe and Dave. Join us here every Thursday for a new episode. And be sure to check out the Reviews Without Remorse channel on YouTube and Vidme for spoiler-free reviews of new releases as well as in-depth discussions of current and classic cinema. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider becoming a patron. You can find our page at patreon.com. As little as $1 a month goes a long way. All clips in this podcast are used for commentary and critique and is considered fair use. No copyright infringement is intended. Hello. I've been waiting for you. Who are you? I am the architect. But please, call me Larry. I created the Matrix. Why am I here? The MTV Movie Awards are a systemic anomaly inherent to the programming of the Matrix. Although the transport process has altered your consciousness, you irrevocably remain human, ergo concordantly, vis-a-vis. I have no idea what the hell I'm saying.